these are difficult and uncertain times. It's important for everyone to understand our mission, which is to slow down the spread of this virus in order to protect those at risk of getting very sick, which includes the elderly and the very ill. It's also important to understand that even though most of us will have mild to moderate symptoms if we get it, we can all transmit it. So we all have a role to play in making sure we don't pass it on to those who are at the highest risk. To further the point, the best information we currently have from the experts, learning from other countries, says that slowing it down is the best way to make sure the care is available to those who need it, especially the most vulnerable who may need hospitalization. This is literally in our hands. We need everyone to accept this reality and be part of this effort. Slowing this down or flattening the curve is the most important thing we can do. Mitigation, along with simple steps like washing your hands a lot, staying home when, you're, when you can, and social distancing can help protect loved ones, friends, and neighbors who are at higher risk. On Friday, to act on this strategy, I declared a state of emergency, and we put in place a wide range of measures to slow this pandemic, from limiting public gatherings and restricting visitors at long-term care facilities and hospitals, to banning state employee work travel, encouraging and facilitating telework, extending unemployment benefits for those who are, have to be self-isolated, and much, much more. Sunday, I ordered the dismissal of pre-K through 12 schools, which began today. With it came the challenge of coming up with an education plan so kids can continue to learn. Monday, I ordered the closure of bars and restaurants statewide, though they can still offer takeout. And yesterday, I directed the closure of licensed child care centers across the state. However, I've asked centers and schools to provide child care services for those deemed essential personnel. This includes health care and public health workers, first responders and those involved in our state emergency operations centers, and many others knowing we may need to add to this list. I realize, even as we ask many to step back to help slow the spread of this virus, we're asking others including educators and child care providers, to step up and provide a critical service so those who are on the front lines can continue to care for the sick, protect the public, and manage the, this ever-evolving challenge. Now, I know some won't be able to, and that's okay. But for those who can, we appreciate your help because filling the need by teachers, child care providers, and school support staff is critical to our response. Understanding how challenging but important these directives are, I've also asked Neil Lunderville and Liz Miller to lead this effort to support the Agency of Education with this critical work. Liz, Liz who served under Governor Shumlin, and Neil, who served under Governor Douglas, have a wealth of experience in state government and the private sector and have already hit the ground running and they're working on other projects uh, as well. I want to, again, remind Vermonters that more measures are inevitable. We're already working on a directive for hospitals to postpone elective procedures. More details will come on this and others, but I will continue to make decisions based on science, data, and the guidance of an incredible team of leaders and experts I have working with me. This is a moment of service for all of us, from those working on the front lines in healthcare to those who are simply following our social distancing guidance to protect others. We're all in this together, and we will get through it. Just like during Irene, we're facing new challenges every single day. And I know some are feeling scared, worried, and overwhelmed just like after Irene. 
but we made it through. And we'll do it again because we're Vermont strong. In times like this, Vermonters rise to the occasion. We help our neighbors. We answer the call of duty. And we get creative to solve big problems. I'm seeing it every day from healthcare workers, state employees, school administrators, and business owners, from those adjusting hours at grocery stores and adding curbside service, to organizing online car drives to send love to their grandparents who can't have visitors right now, and so many more initiatives. These people, with their compassion and commitment to service, show me that we will get through this, and we'll do it together. So I'm now going to turn this over to Education Secretary Dan French to share more details on our latest education guidance. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good morning. Uh, this is an unprecedented situation that's calling on everyone to make uh, difficult decisions and to take quick actions. I wanted to highlight a few aspects of this work. Uh, firstly, child care. Uh, we issued new guidance to schools last night to support the provision <clears throat> of child care for the children of essential personnel. Uh, these essential persons include uh, currently educators, health care providers and emergency workers, first responders, service men and women in our National Guard who have been activated for COVID-19, and state employees working on the COVID-19 emergency response. Schools have been directed to provide care to enrolled students up to at least grade eight and where necessary to students from other towns or districts. And we are currently working with districts this morning to support them in organizing this work. Our guidance also directs the continued payment of pre-K tuition uh, to private providers as established under Act 166. Uh, these funds are already in school budgets and paid for out of the education fund. Uh, we mentioned uh, our work under feeding students. Uh, we've received the necessary waiver from the USDA to offer reimbursed student meals on a distributed basis. Uh, 39 of our approximately 60 supervisor unions have applications approved and are ready to start serving meals. Many are doing so today. Seven other SUs are in the process of having their applications finalized and we are working directly with the remaining SUs to expedite their application process. Labor issues have emerged as a concern. Uh, we're asking a lot of our education labor force uh, during the state of emergency. We need their expertise and dedication as we navigate these uncharted and unprecedented times. We have directed education staff to report to work during this two-week period of school closure to accomplish three main objectives. One, to maintain the education programs of students. Two, to support our most vulnerable students. And three, to plan for the continuity of education programs in the event of a prolonged school closure. We are not expecting school staff to report to work if they have concerns about their personal, personal health. Specifically, the following educators are not required to be in public school buildings. Educators with compromised immune conditions, educators who reside with someone with a compromised immune condition, educators suffering from anxiety, expectant educators, educators with infants, and educators over 60. In other words, anyone with a serious physical or mental health issue is not being required to be in a public building. Also, I've directed schools to ensure all staff get paid for their regular scheduled hours during this two-week period. <laughs> Lastly, I just want to mention uh, work we're doing around this issue of continuity of education. As I mentioned, we are using this two-week closure period to prepare for an extended period of school closure if that becomes necessary. We are actively engaged in planning work at the agency and at the local level to ensure all students will be able to continue to make academic progress in the event of a longer period of school closure. Many of our high schools can deliver instruction online, even though student access to the internet and computers at home is uneven around the state. We will need to be more creative with the provision of educational services at the elementary and primary grades. Uh, but we will work closely with districts to start and plan this work together. And I'm very optimistic about our ability to creatively solve that issue. Um, now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. First, I'd like to give somewhat of a situational update. Um, at the moment, we have 19 total positive tests in Vermont. To put that in perspective, that's out of a total testing 
a run of about 600 tests. So clearly um, far more negatives than positives, but obviously we're going to focus on these positives very intently. We always discuss how many people we're still monitoring in the state as a health department, and I'm not going to give you a precise number because that changes so rapidly. Each time you have a positive test result, uh, there's abundance of surveillance and phone calls and interactions with people who may or may not have had contact with the actual case. And if that case happens to be in a healthcare setting, um, the numbers can get quite large. So just accept the fact that there are hundreds of Vermonters that are being uh, monitored and interacted with uh, regarding these 19 positive tests. I wanted to just spend a few moments um, and feed off of a bit what the government, governor was saying about uh, the overall strategy, just so people can sort of see with some clarity uh, why all this is happening so fast and where we're going, both as a state and uh, in some respects as a nation. So there are some fancy words, but um, everything began with the word containment. And containment is kind of just what it says. You identify cases. To identify cases means you have to be testing, so you need to have some capacity to test, and you have to have some ability to prioritize those tests. Having done that, you begin to identify cases, and you rapidly isolate those cases, assuming they're in the community still and not requiring hospitalization. And we've had plenty who are still in the community that did not require hospitalization, to be clear about that. And then we do something called contact tracing, so that we make sure that those who may have had some contact with the case know exactly what it is they should do to prevent further transmission of COVID-19 across our communities. We are still doing that, and that's what I would term a parallel strategy to the now more significant strategy of mitigation. Trying to slow, but not necessarily stop, the viral spread, because we know we can't stop it at this point, but we can slow it down. And we've shown you curves before in the past that really focus on our ability to not have a rapid spike and overwhelm our healthcare system, but to have a more gradual flattened curve, which frankly may take longer to dissipate, but will have a much lower burden on the population at large and on the healthcare system's ability to cope. The prime mitigation strategy goes under the other fancy term, social distancing, which I hope everyone sees we're trying to practice up here on the podium today. Uh, maintaining that distance from others that, as human beings, we don't do every day. That's not what we're accustomed to. We high five, we shake hands, we embrace. Um, well, we're asking Vermonters to go through a significant amount of behavior change. And that's uncomfortable, and that's something you have to kind of be actually conscious of every time because your tendency is to do the things you've always done. So we understand that that's hard and may require a lot of support. And all the strategies that have occurred uh, since we really call this an emergency, in a state of emergency, are really falling into place in that social distancing category. So some of them had to do with protecting our most vulnerable and our elderly regarding visitation pro, uh, policies to hospitals, to long-term care facilities, nursing homes, etc. Some of them had to do with how we tend to gather in groups, and you've heard numbers go from 250 down to 50, and to me, the number is irrelevant because people are already understanding that it's probably not a good idea to be in a crowd uh, at a time when you're talking about an infectious disease that can be easily transmitted through the air from one person to another. So people are already falling into line with that, and it's just the idea that we don't get into congregate settings that are very crowded. Then they have all of the issues of schools, which you've just heard about, which I won't perseverate on. Changes in work policies, changes in the way that uh, workers can or cannot travel. And then really, um, as part of the gregarious nature of human beings, where do we usually do that? Well, we do that sometimes in restaurants and bars. And now yeah, you've heard new policies regarding those. 
And the only thing I want to say about those is, again, every step of the way in managing this, I think, very manageable uh, epidemic requires resourcefulness, creativity, innovation. And even restaurants and bars can be innovative, as they're all learning now with bring something to your car, take out priority, uh, interacting with people in ways that they have to to deliver food, but still being able to actually do that, even though people can't sit down at a table with one another uh, inside their premises. So again, I know this requires significant behavior change and hard work, um, and nobody's going to deny how hard it may be. Really does require sort of a social compact and an idea that we're all here to cooperate with one another, uh, and I'm confident that we as a state can rally to that cause. The final stage of sort of uh, where we're going and the aspiration of all of us in the United States, never mind just Vermont, is a state where they sometimes call it suppression. So you've slowed the growth of the curve, it's been flattened, but eventually you want it to come down. And that's when you enter that state. We have good experience now just by watching the rest of the world, because as you know, the US was not the first country to be affected. So even though China has received a lot of crit criticism, um, they are now in a phase where things are much more controlled and they're seeing decreasing numbers of cases all the time, especially in that hot zone, but even in the rest of their country. South Korea is another example of that. And soon we hope we'll have some European examples of that. We need to observe critically and learn from those experiences. And I'm confident that we will. We will also learn about the timing of these things. We can set arbitrary dates of two weeks of this or three weeks of that, maybe a month, maybe two months, uh, but we'll actually get a little more certainty about how we actually figure that out because we'll learn from their experiences and see as they've eased up on some of these more restrictive policies uh, how things have gone. And is this something that in the short term can be managed very well? Or is it something that we're really in for a long-term kind of uh, approach to until vaccines develop sometime in the next 12 to 12 plus months? So again, uh, these, we know these things have a lot of impact. They have impacts socially, economically, health-wise, et cetera. But we will learn from other experiences and I think benefit from those and really begin to see where the light is at the end of the tunnel in terms of how the strategies you've heard outlined today uh, can play out in the future. Uh, I believe I'm the last speaker. I'm happy to turn it over to questions right now. Are we taking one from the floor first? We're gonna take one from the phone first. So okay. Wilson or Lisa from the AP. Hi, it's Lisa from AP. Um, I noticed that the state is now um, delineating between uh, Vermonters and non-residents who have gotten positive results of uh, who have COVID-19. And why is that? And and uh, does it make a difference to that? Um, yeah, thank you very much. The, the question was about how we report the numbers of those who uh, have positive tests in Vermont. Um, that was a bit of a, a miscommunication on our part, uh, to be quite frank, uh, yesterday. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we were uh, adjusted. We had just one number of both non-resident and resident uh, uh, positive tests uh, and to carry that forward. Uh, what happened was they eliminated the non-resident and, and carried the res uh, Vermont uh, number. Um, so the point was, and we've clarified this and now it's rectified, uh, we'll be reporting just one number of those affected uh, in Vermont, that have the positive test in Vermont uh, from now going forward. Okay, so the next question, Molly from Seven Days. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, Governor and Secretary French, if you could speak to um, any continued risk at the child care uh, facilities caring for emergency workers and health workers. Obviously, your order of um, closure was designed to reduce the spread, but um, are there any steps under uh, considered to, to, to keep addressing that spread at these more limited uh, centers? 
I'll have uh, Secretary French uh, offer a few words and then maybe someone else, uh, Secretary Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, in our guidance that was uh, published last night, we talk about uh, the social distancing measures and our continued disinfection measures to ensure uh, that these workplaces are safe. Um, but it is a priority to ensure that uh, those, those employees and workers that are on the front line of this emergency uh, don't have to worry about their child care needs and, and uh, we're working hard to accomplish both of those uh, goals. Molly, this is Mike Smith at AHS. As you know, we've limited the size of the uh, classroom size for these facilities down to 10. Uh, that means no more than 10 people in that room. We've also put the various sanitation requirements in place and if we need to make those stricter, we will. Both Dan and myself have the ability to make stricter recommendations as we move forward. So right now, we, we limited the class size. We've put in fairly strict uh, sanitation sort of uh, requirements, and uh, we feel that will ensure or at least um, make people feel comfortable about the safety of the decision we've made. Thank you. Uh, Governor, just your reaction to the President announcing earlier today that uh, joint decision between the United States and Canada to close the northern border except for essential traffic? Um, I wasn't aware uh, of the uh, directive from the President, so I don't know the details of that. Uh, obviously, we have a few concerns. We have uh, employees uh, who live in Canada uh, that are part of our health care system in the northeast region and maybe even in the northwest region. Um, so that's a concern. I would think they would qualify as being essential. Um, and we have to do everything we can. Uh, I know Canada has taken some extreme steps uh, as well in Quebec and across the whole, uh, the whole uh, country. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to have to do the same. So um, I would assume uh, that uh, in conjunction with, uh, with Canada, uh, this is the right uh, step to take uh, while understanding that we have a lot of uh, trade. Uh, and we uh, still rely on a number of employees from there. Anyone else want to add anything to that? Lola from BC Digger. Um, hi. I was wondering, are, are you concerned about the ability of uh, schools to be able to carry out this mandate to provide this child care um, you know, especially in, in more thinly staffed districts that might see a lot of staff say, I, I can't carry out this work, um, you know, either because I'm anxious for myself or immunocompromised or et cetera, et cetera. Secretary French. Hi, Lola. Um, yes, I mean, it is a concern. And uh, we've been actively engaged with districts this morning as they're uh, trying to navigate both the provision of continuity of education and child care service. Uh, at the same time, I think we've seen some really creative responses and really positive support of teachers stepping up uh, to help assist in this mo moment of emergency. So it's going to be challenges, but just one in a series of challenges that we're going to have to navigate. But as, as Dr. Levine and the governor said, our priority now is to bend that curve as best we can. And I think uh, is a moment of service for all of us. And I know uh, educators and teachers will step up and, and help in that regard. Super quick follow-up. I'm so sorry. Um, what about uh, so child care has been asked to do this but not you know ordered schools have um you know if you have a three-year-old and you're a nurse um can you and your child care is shut down can you bring them to the local public school uh, in our guidance we had to make a delineation uh, between students age zero uh, for five and six through uh, eighth grade so Currently, public schools are equipped to handle uh, age six up to eighth grade fairly easily, both from a safety and an educational standpoint. We were less comfortable uh, making a provision for uh, younger, younger children under five, but we'll certainly reevaluate if the need becomes uh, uh, necessary. Let me, let me just... Uh, so right this, now it's a, oh, go ahead. This is Mike Smith. Let me just sort of bring the pre-K up uh, where we are right now. It's, as you know, we've, uh, we have instituted a pre-K pre program for essential uh, children 
and those child care uh, centers were starting to contact now last night we contacted 41 programs in just one uh, one and a half hours so far 288 um, children have been identified as essential people uh, we I, I I've got to emphasize this there has been enormous collaboration among the private child care providers and we can't thank them enough in terms of what we're doing and how we're moving forward to this we've actually ID'd many potential additional staff to deploy to other facilities that may be limited uh, to uh, to a, a facility that needs those employees so we really are seeing the healthcare um, excuse me the uh, I'm in so many different realms here but the uh, child care uh, community really stepping up to this and many center many centers have told us that they're willing to work extra shifts so we are grateful uh, to all the kids uh, all the centers we're working with organizations like let's grow kids uh, to bring all this together and I've got to say uh, just in what I'm hearing in the feedback that's coming back it's incredible how Vermonters are trying to help Vermonters uh, get through this time Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, so uh, yesterday the state of New Hampshire announced that it was expanding unemployment benefits for people who have to stay home with school age children. Has Vermont considered, enacted, discussed this at all? Yeah, I'm going to have our, our Commissioner of Labor answer that. Sure. So um, I had a chance to review uh, the legislation that came out of New Hampshire, and while I haven't been able to do the background on it, um, one thing that needs to be considered is uh, it looks like there was some legislation passed that allowed those individuals to become eligible, uh, and that is something we are working with the Vermont legislature right now uh, to expand benefits to those that have to stay home. Uh, with a family member who becomes ill or is quarantined or isolated. So, uh, yes, we are considering it, uh, and it is moving through the legislative process, but it does require a change in state statute. Uh, I would also uh, add, yeah, I would also add that yeah. the, the legislature uh, has been very receptive to any of our needs uh, and has sort of a, a very willing partner. So uh, we're working through many of those initiatives as well as many others uh, at this point in time. Thank you. Pete, DPR. Thank you, Brittany. Um, it seems to be some increasing concern um, about Vermont's inmate population. Uh, are you testing individuals that are entering the correction system right now as inmates? Can you talk about any other specific mitigation strategies, um, Mike, that you're using to uh, address that concern? So sure. we are testing in terms of screen testing uh, inmates that are coming in to the facilities. Uh, if you're talking COVID-19 testing, the answer is no because they aren't showing symptoms of uh, COVID-19 or they wouldn't be allowed into the facility. So we are screening those. We've also put uh, video visiting um, apparatus so that uh, visitors are now uh, can't meet uh, personally with uh, inmates, but they can meet via video conferencing. We also are looking at how we s segregate our population to be in smaller groups when they're in recreation areas. We have contingency plans that have been put in place in case we do have a uh, illness within our facility. So there, the social distancing things that you see um, are a little bit different in, in, in our correctional facilities, but we're putting in place those social distancing where we can. And in many cases, you'll see the social distancing um, happen within our correctional facilities. I do want to emphasize that we, we, are pretty, we are being pretty stringent on making sure that those screening processes are happening on entrance are really diligent uh, as we move forward. We cannot allow a case to come into 
the correctional facility. One last thing, Peter. We are um, stocking up on supplies a little bit more than we normally would in case we have an outbreak. That includes mat supplies uh, for those who are, have, uh, are under medical uh, treatment for addiction. So we're, uh, we're doing all that right now, and there's other contingency plans in place or being worked on. Commissioner Levine. <clears throat> Thank you for asking about testing. So I, I don't want to give the appearance I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but I do want to show reality and optimism at the same time. Um, we have testing capacity now to do all of the testing that we've currently been asked to do in terms of physicians coming to the clinical judgment that their patient should have testing. We are grouping those into higher and lower priority. I think you'll understand that those in the higher priority group might be in a hospital bed or in an ICU bed. Uh, they may be a healthcare worker who has to know if they can continue to work in the healthcare system, et cetera. We have done all of our testing in state at our public health lab because like most states, that's what we have available to us right now. And in that public health lab, we have supplies of test kits and reagents and everything that's needed to do the test, but we are limited in how far that supply will take us. We have literally 10 or 12 pathways that we're looking at simultaneously for obtaining more test kits, reagent supplies, uh, machinery to do the testing with, personnel to do the testing, uh, and that's at all levels, local, regional, national, that's public and private. So it's quite expansive. Vermont is no different than any other state in the country uh, with regards to not being able to do what I would call expansive health surveillance, knowing in the entire population how much disease is present, whether there are people who are asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic compared to those who are acutely ill in a hospital setting. Uh, but I think as a country, you're going to find in the next week or two, we are all going to catch up rather rapidly. So we're working very closely with the uh, Health and Human Services apparatus in Washington, with the FDA and with the CDC, all in actually separate strategies. We are working very closely with the UVM College of Medicine and the UVM Medical Center, and we are working very closely with the uh, partnership you've often heard about from the federal level of uh, public-private partnership with companies that are commercial and will have testing capability as we speak. They're just coming online now. So what I envision is that we will have greater local support through our affiliation and partnering with the uh, UVM College of Medicine and Medical Center, and that will help us with this more high-priority group, which we'll continue to maintain in state, and we'll have opportunities to do more of the lower priority but necessary, uh, not only public health work, but reassuring our citizens' work about their conditions through these more national lab testing op opportunities. But I have to provide a realistic expectation, expectation that these national opportunities won't have the turnaround time we've come to expect locally, which is within 24 hours. They may be 72 hours, maybe even as long as 96 hours, but we'll be careful to make sure that they are in the group that is lower priority. I do want all Vermonters to know that we still need to have rational and reasonable expectations of who should be tested, who should not be tested, and our clinical community understands that and will work with their patients to uh, help them understand that because at the present time, uh, it could overwhelm the system if everybody felt that their test was the most important and that they needed to uh, have it done immediately because uh, we're certainly not in a situation where we can do that today. Patricia from Bennington Banner. Patricia, 
Patricia Bennington Banner. Oh, the mute button. Sorry. I see in the guidance here that during the closure period, schools are directed to provide care to, at a minimum, students enrolled in, in their school up to grade eight. Would that be, that does not include uh, pre-kindergarten students, correct? I believe Secretary French mentioned this. It's just kindergarten up through grade eight that are currently enrolled at that school? Uh, the guidance speaks to age six as being the cutoff, not necessarily distinguishing between pre-K. Uh, the guidance also speaks to the eventuality of uh, giving uh, those essential employees the opportunity to, to place their student in a district other than their home district. So for instance, if uh, it was more convenient for them to uh, access care in a school that's located in the community where they work, uh, we want to provide for the maximum flexibility in that regard. So they have to provide care um, these schools for age six um, up to grade eight. Currently, as of right now, the students that are enrolled in that school. And for eventually, and, and if there's a, a need for those uh, essential workers that might uh, be working in those communities and find it more convenient to access care in that, in that location. Liz, Burlington <laughs> Free Press. Hi, thank you. Um, I wondered how many child, hello? Yes, we, we have you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I wondered how many child care centers um, in the state are going to be um, closed down because of this order, if you guys have any idea um, as to the number at this point. The governor's order requires all child care centers to be closed down with, uh, with the exception of, of meeting the needs of the essential persons. We don't have, we'll have an accurate picture of that by the end of the day of how many that will be. But one of the things that I just want to emphasize as we're looking at this is we wanted to make sure that the health, that the child care system was still in place as we rolled through this crisis. And what we have decided to do is continue the subsidies for the, for the health, uh, for the child care system as we uh, as we move forward so if a child care system does close down we will continue the subsidies for that child care system and if they take essential people uh, essential personnel's children we'll look at how we can make that more of an incentive for that uh, child care uh, facility uh, to take those children and that's something we're looking at right now Yeah, Dr. Levine here. I'll, I'll take the uh, nursing home. Um, when it comes to nursing homes, obviously, by definition, everyone there is a vulnerable population. So we have to have consistently across nursing homes adequate guidelines in place and adequate regulatory structure that would make it uh, important for them to adhere to. And I want people to be reassured that that does exist in Vermont. And indeed, this particular facility that we're focusing on, um, if I could use the word, passed with flying colors without any deficiencies uh, about four or five months ago. Um, all nursing homes are, of course, petrified in the wintertime of infectious diseases that can take hold there not just COVID-19, but other viruses, including the flu. So they have to have effective infection control programs in place. They have to have good advisement about those programs, and they do. So we're certain that they have the programs at this facility. The health department and uh, Dale were instrumental in sending out abundant communications as the COVID epidemic began regarding good prevention strategies, good surveillance strategies, et cetera. And uh, now that we have a case, obviously we have uh, embarked on a significant venture here to 
work with the nursing home to identify all those in the nursing home, specifically those who work there, but others as well, who may have had contact with this index case. In addition to that, we have part of our uh, public health team with skills in infection prevention actually going to the nursing home to actually work with them and support them in their activities and make sure that all the appropriate uh, containment processes and uh, prevention practices are in place. Nick, oh, please, we got, we got another part to the question. Sorry, hold please. Colin, I, I believe you said furloughed um, prisoners, is, or furloughed inmates, is that what your question was? What are we doing in terms of, yeah. of those? Well, furloughed, uh, furloughed inmates are, are usually outside the facility is what you're talking about. They are under the sort of the same guidance that everybody would be under in terms of making sure you self-screen and, and making sure that, you know, you're going to be. My, my question, yeah, my question is more, are we considering furloughing inmates who are in the prisons right now who may be vulnerable or nearing the end of their sentence? At this moment in time, uh, given the fact where we are right now, the answer is no. Nick, local 2244. Thank you all. Uh, so a lot of guidance is, you know, directed towards essential personnel. Uh, what about workers who are not considered essential personnel, you know, such as the food workers? Um, are there children still being allowed at child care facilities? Um, yeah. Hi, it's uh, Mike Sherling from the Department of Public Safety. Uh, the Emergency Operations Center has a task order, which is basically a, an avenue of work that is assessing uh, who is essential and adding to that list uh, over the course of the morning and through the day uh, so we can get that out to the child care centers. And uh, grocery store workers, folks, folks who are distributing food and people in the supply chain that supply that food are essential people, so uh, we expect additional guidance to be available uh, as that list evolves over the course of the day. And as we've uh, we've shown over this uh, short period of time, uh, this is evolving, and we are making changes as we see necessary. So uh, we'll be reflecting on that uh, over the next uh, 24 hours. And. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I wonder what models or scenarios you're working with. Um, national epi epidemiologists are saying that there's a difference between the reported uh, infection rates and um, the actual rates in the community, and they're estimating that they're 10 to 30 times higher than uh, what. Um, we're reporting right now, and I'm wondering what scenarios you're working with right now. What's your model show? Dr. Levine? Yeah, we're relying to some extent on those models, and we're developing our own as well as we speak. Um, suffice it to say that the countries like South Korea that show the lowest case fatality rates have the most testing cap capability and have tested huge swaths of their population. So their denominator of cases is very large. And since the mortality rate, we think, around the world is around 1%, they can show numbers that are significantly lower than 1% because they've identified mild, possibly even asymptomatic cases with the abundance of testing. So there's no question that when we identify 19 cases in Vermont, that there are more than 19 cases in Vermont that we haven't fully identified. Likely, though, is that the majority of those other cases are not very ill, or they would have come to the attention of the healthcare system and been taken care of appropriately. So they would tend to be in the pre or mildly symptomatic or moderately symptomatic range um, and will do well with their illness, et cetera. Um, but having said that, uh, and I know Dr. Levine uh, will emphasize this. Uh, but that's why we put into place uh, so many of these steps and measures, because knowing uh, that there are some who might have this and not even know it, they're still transmitting to others. And that's why social distancing, um, keeping away from others, uh, taking all the precautions that we've been talking about 
is so important for everyone to adhere to. Just, I would, uh, you know, if you, if you don't know for sure, just assume you have it uh, in some respects. Uh, and I'm not trying to create panic. I'm just saying, keep your distance. Uh, make sure you're, you're doing the right thing so you're not infecting others because you may be okay, uh, but you may be harming someone else uh, who is vulnerable. So uh, keep that in mind. If this goes on beyond a couple of follow up, please? Can I, can I, sure. can I ask a follow up? Yeah. Please? Go ahead, Ian. Do we have a, do we, thank you very much. Um, do we have enough ventilators, ICU beds, and beds in general in Vermont? Well, I understand we only have 210 ventilators, for example, and that we might have, you know, say more than 1,000 cases at some point. What, what are we going to do about that? Other states are pretty upset about that. Governor, were you on the call with, uh, with Mr. Trump? Um, when he talked about states having five ventilators. Yeah, I mean it was uh, it was slightly nuanced from that, but uh, but yes, I was on that call uh, when other uh, governors were showing um, some apprehension uh, in that regard. But um, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer the question about the ventilators and bed space. And Mike Smith, uh, we currently have 273. Uh, available beds in the state as of this morning. That does not include possible surge beds. It does not include the capability to open up temporary facilities using the National Guard or other sort of temporary facilities. We have 245 uh, uh, ventilators that are available in this state. Again, um, if this was, uh, as the governor had mentioned, uh, we are trying to ramp up to add capability as we move forward here. And, and I think one of the things that the governor has always told us is think ahead. Think ahead the next 72 hours to know what we need and where we're going in terms of our needs. And I think that's an important message. Well, how, many, how many ventilators do you think we need, Mike? We're uncertain right now, and we're working on that modeling in case uh, we have to use it. But um, right now, I, all I have for you is the number of available ventilators at 273. When will the modeling be done? What was that? When will the modeling be done? We're, we're working on it, and I'll let you know when I can. Okay, next question, Mike. Thank you. Um, Mike Velasco with you, North Report. Um, if this goes on beyond a couple of weeks, the economic damage to people's lives and businesses is going to be overwhelming. Uh, what are you going to do then? Yeah, well, obviously, uh, this is going to affect our entire country, our entire world uh, from an economic standpoint. Uh, and it's just not a question of if it's going to happen. It's just a question of the magnitude. Uh, I've been in constant contact with our federal de delegation uh, Congressman Welch, Senator Leahy, uh, I had a call from uh, Senator Sanders yesterday afternoon, uh, all t talking about what what is it you need? What do you need to, to get through this? And obviously, uh, we don't know at this point other than we're going to need uh, federal assistance, uh, flexibility, uh, in, uh, in all kinds of different ways. And I know they're working uh, diligently on this, uh, this effort right now. Uh, it looks like it's going to be uh, over a, a trillion dollar uh, package uh, that will uh, will be coming uh, to the states. So uh, suffice it to say, we don't know what our needs are, but we know we're going to need some assistance uh, in order to get through this. Thank you. Amy, Caledonian Record. Yes, thank you. Dr. Levine, you said your state is monitoring hundreds of people connected to the 19 confirmed cases. Are there any counties in Vermont that do not have people being monitored? And can you speak specifically to the Northeast Kingdom? Six yeah. counties at this point. About half of our counties have documented cases and half don't. But I have to be careful okay. when, to, when you're talking about who we're monitoring as a result of a case. Uh, they may live outside the county that we're concerned about if they were at a gathering with the person or what have you. So hard to say. But consider the fact that half the state has documented cases and that half is geographically heterogeneous, so it's not like any corner of the state is exempt. And we, you know, we have asked uh, those who have been, have uh, traveled to other countries 
uh, to self-isolate. So there may be uh, some self-isolating in uh, Caledonia County as well. I would expect most counties have some who are self-isolating and, and we're monitoring. Okay, so we have time for one Thank last you, Dr. Question. Levine and Governor. One last question, uh, Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, I talked to uh, many educators and it looks like they're gonna start the learning program uh, this Monday, the 23rd which would trigger the free and appropriate public education requirements of the federal law. Uh, as I read your document, uh, <coughs> Governor, um, these will be more complicated than just picking up a packet at school or you know, doing an online course. What is, what is the, the plan for uh, kids on IEPs starting as early as Monday? Hi, this is uh, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Uh, we put out guidance last night on special education compliance, and we're certainly waiting for uh, more guidance from the federal government on this. Uh, during this two-week period, we're expecting uh, districts to just maintain uh, academic performance and progress of students. So at this point, uh, during the two-week period, it's not triggering necessarily a change in students' individual education programs under special ed law, but we do have to start planning for that eventuality if school closure is prolonged beyond the, beyond the two-week period. Again, uh, I want to thank everyone, everyone on the phone, as well as the, those uh, who are here from the media uh, for your uh, great work in trying to keep your uh, listeners informed and your readers informed. It's really important that we get this right, uh, that we give all the facts we can uh, to try and do whatever we can to help assist people as well as to calm their fears um, because uh, this is going to be a long haul. Uh, it's not going to be solved overnight. And we're all going to have to work together in order to uh, to get to the uh, to the end of this. So I thank you uh, for your efforts.